to the conference in honor of Doran Zalberger's 60th birthday. Um, I'm Aaron Robertson, um, and I'll be the moderator this morning and next morning. So as you see from the schedule, it's very packed. The talks are scheduled back to back. So the moderator will stand up when there's 10 minutes to the end of the talk. Built into that 10 minutes are five minutes for questions and answers. So just to let you know, we like to keep on schedule as much as possible. There were more people than we could, that wanted to talk than fit. So we squeezed as many as we could. Uh, also, there are Zalberger's rules of conduct. This is from opinion number 96, I believe. Um, so these are not my words. I'm just going to announce them so everybody knows. You may leave at any time. It's better to leave than do your own work. Absolutely no laptops, even for taking notes. No talking without permission. No cell phones, so you should put them on vibrate now. <laughs> and absolutely no outside work, including but not limited to prepping for class, grading, reading newspapers, reading math problems, doing monthly problems, doing proofreading, refereeing, etc. <laughs> also, there's one rule that was not in that opinion that um, Salberger always says never go over time. So, Again, I will stand up when there's 10 minutes left. And I would like to introduce our first speaker, Herb Wilf, who will be talking about how to lose as little as possible. Good morning. <coughs> as usual, we can share a Good morning. It's a great pleasure to be here for Doron's birthday. Happy birthday, Doron. I'm sure that what he does in the next 60 years will make the first 60 pale in comparison. <laughs> as far as the rules of conduct are concerned, I'm reminded of a Monty Python skit in which there are a number of rules of conduct enunciated, and then we come to Rule 6, which states that there is no Rule 6. <laughs> How to lose as little as possible uh, will be a 38 minute and 19 second paper <laughs> by Victoria Adona, Stan Wagon, and myself, which is about the following problem, very concrete little problem. But the reason, main reason I'm talking about it here is that uh, Duran's algorithm, uh, Zalberger's algorithm, plays an absolutely key role in solving this thing as you will see. Are you hearing me in the back? Okay, thank you. Good. Um, in fact, it's the two-dimensional version of the algorithm that does it. Right, so the problem is this. Bob has a coin whose head's probability is P. <laughs> Alice has a coin whose head's probability is Q, less than P. Uh, to fix ideas, it'd be helpful to think of Q as being a little bit less than P. It doesn't really affect anything, but it's more fun that way. So think of 0.18 and 0.2, or thereabouts. OK. Anyway, her head probability is smaller. Alice now chooses a positive integer n, and each person tosses their coin n times. Okay. Now, Alice wins if she gets more heads than Bob does. Now, this is a great game for the male gender, <laughs> because her head's probability is larger on uh, Bob's coin. So of course, he's quite likely to win the game as formulated. Nevertheless, there's a substantive question here. The question is, what positive integer should Alice choose, or does it make a difference? Or is n equals 1 the answer, which is what I thought when I first saw this problem, that it might as well be n equals 1. And to give you a quick preview of the rest of the talk, it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not. OK, anyway. So that's the question. Is it clear what the question is? Any questions yeah. any question about the question? Oh. Right. Ties go to Bob. Uh, ties. Yeah, more heads. 
Well, sorry. The question is who gets more heads? Well, yeah, if they get the same, the number, same heads, number of heads, then no but I'm only going to address the question of what's the probability that Alice will get more heads, more heads than Bob. Ties don't count for her winnings. So we use the strictly more in the question. Is that right? Yeah. No. Okay. Here is the case where P is 0.2 and Q is 0.18. And what you're looking at is a graph of the probability that Alice wins this game as a function of the number of tosses that are that happens, and in other words, the number n that is chosen for the number of tosses. So if she takes n equals 1, the chance that she'll win is about 0.14, a calculation that will take you about 3 microseconds. Um, the probability of her winning seems at least to, to rise to a unimodal maximum and then to fall off, and that's in fact exactly what it does. The maximum in this case is at around 0.26. The maximum probability of winning that she can achieve, which will never get as big as 0.5 for sure, uh, but it gets up to around 0.1. It says it on the next slide. In this example, if each player flips their coin 26 times, which is the best choice for Alice, 26, Alice's chance of winning will be about 0.36, compared to a chance of 0.14 if each coin is tossed only once. Chelsea has almost tripled her chances if she asks for 26 tosses, as opposed to asking for a single toss. Now there are a million questions here. Can we prove that the shape is in fact unimodal? There's a non-trivial maximum. Where is it? Etc. Okay, but that's the problem set. Okay, so here is her chance of winning if she chooses N. Um, so if you choose n tosses, this is just a, like the uh, binomial formula for probabilities of tossing a coin. Uh, their n choose are ways of choosing which r of the tosses Bob will get heads, and p to the r is times 1 minus p to the n minus r is the probability that exactly on that, you know, on that set of cardinality r, he will in fact get heads. And then for that given r, this, is the, this over here is the probability that Alice's S will be larger than R. So that's the formula of F of N, whose graph was being plotted, in fact, on the previous slide. It's a graph of this function right here. So the question is, what can one prove about this function? Well, after long training by Zeilberger, I realized that when you have a double sum, the solution is not to think, but to dash for your computer. So I dashed for my computer. And I found that Papagodou and Zellberger had very conveniently found a multi multivariate uh, out version of Zellberger's algorithm. And uh, I used it. I had never actually used the, the multivariate one before. But it worked like a charm. And it did everything it was supposed to do. So let's see what happens. Uh, now, I think. But almost everybody, that is to say, all but quite a number of people in the room, know about the basic stuff involving computerized discovery and proof of identity. Nevertheless, I will use the next two minutes and nine seconds to check on the basic principles of what happens, and then we'll get into the two dimensional version of what happens in this problem. So, a couple of remarks about what's going on in general. Suppose we're in one variable. And you have a function f of n, which is a sum over k of capital F of n and k. What we want to do is find the recurrence for the sum of n, and then sum it over k. That's how one finds recurrences for sums. So if you're given a sum to find the recurrence for the sum, first find the recurrence for the sum of n. For example, if you take this one, which we all know when we were born, it turns out to be 2 to the n. <coughs> but if you want a recurrence for this to prove that it's 2 to the n, you first find a recurrence for the sum n, and choose k, namely this is the one you, you know yourself, or else the Alberger's algorithm will find it for you if you really want to use that. But here's a recurrence for the sum n. And now just sum this recurrence right here over k. And you see on the left side it says f of n. And here it says f of n minus 1, and you sum it over k. And here it says f of n minus 1 again. So each f of n is twice f of n minus 1, and that's all you that f of n is 2 to the n. So this is the computerized way to prove identities. 